Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, uh, it is a uh, momentous occasion where we're getting to see the unveiling of uh, a portrait of uh, Judge Myron Thompson, um, uh, commemorating 42 years on the bench. Um, and uh, we're having a conversation this afternoon with the judge and the artist, Wade McIntosh, um, to hear how this piece of art came together. Um, my name is Orion Danjuma. Um, I am a former law clerk to Judge Thompson uh, in the glorious year from 2010 to 2011. And I'm really honored to get to talk to you about this beautiful piece of art and what it meant to you to create this together. Um, now, creating a piece of art like this is a bit of a journey, uh, but, uh, uh, a journey that you set out on with the artist and the subject. And I'm curious to know just from the start, how did you, how did you connect with each other? How did you come to learn of one another? Well, uh, when the court itself decided that I needed to have a portraiture done, um, my clerks got together and apparently talked to a number of people and came up with a list of artists whom they thought would be appropriate for, for me. And uh, uh, Wade was one of the finalists, and indeed I think he was the choice among the finalists to do the forfeiture. And uh, uh, I agreed all the way. And when I had seen his other work, I thought that he was uh, the perfect person uh, to do my painting. And what drew you to, uh, the, to uh, the art from his other work? What, what were you well, to be candid with you, I was curious that he could do two things. Um, I, I, from studying classical history in college, and in particular art history, um, I always found it fascinating how artists could do drapery, things like robes and you know and make it look like it was real cloth and almost as if the folding and the folds came off the painting and you know how, how do you do that with a brush so that you could almost feel like you could touch the the uh, the drapery the folds and i had seen some of his works which were submitted as uh, samples to me and that was the first thing that drew me to him i love the way he drew uh drapery and obviously, as a judge, I knew that uh, I would be wearing a robe. So I wanted someone who just didn't drew, who didn't draw a robe as sort of a flat uh, piece of cloth, but more in that traditional sense of, uh, of 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 the luxuriousness of it. Even though, ironically, I don't wear a luxurious robe; I wear a very simple uh, uh, robe. But I thought the painting should should reflect one of my more uh, uh, what I would call formal robes. But that was the first thing. The second thing was I, I, I wanted to make sure that he knew how to draw black people. And, you know, and he was sensitive to skin texture and uh, that he could uh, capture at least me, I guess it, primarily in the way of just how I looked, you know. And I realized that in a portrait you draw uh, sort of different hues and it comes together and creates the overall person and so it's just not flat like a portrait and I had seen some of his other works and I, I was impressed with that. Uh, thirdly, um, I had looked at some of his other works and I was impressed that he included in these portraits, or just pictures actually, um, surrounding items that tended to uh, uh, explain the person who was at the center of the picture. So I wanted someone who would not just do a picture of me, but who could perhaps capture uh, me in the full sense of what things in my life mattered. Um, what things in my life uh, made me who I am, and uh, and and put all that together in in a in a picture. Um, so I didn't want the picture to be a portrait. I didn't want the portrait to be a photograph. I wanted it to be more of a composition. 
And looking at some of his works, I saw that composition quality. Yeah. And I, I will say one of the striking, the most striking things about this piece of art for me is how so many of the details are sort of the cover of a, of a book that you can go into a story about each of the details in this painting. And it's one of the things that I think makes it really beautiful. I wanted to ask you, Wade, how did you get started? How were you drawn into portraiture in the first place? How were you um, drawn into this art form? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so. My entire life, art has been a, a significant part of it. Uh, my mom uh, minored in art when I was uh, younger. And um, she, she wasn't a portrait artist. She was more like a landscape artist. But she allowed me, she sparked that interest in art. And it just kind of progressed. Um, I also loved landscape painting, but it wasn't something that I was really like interested in the, the way she was. So I was more drawn to the figure and motion and movement. And portraiture just seemed like the natural thing. Um, and what I'm, I'm interested to hear from Judge is the reasons why he selected me. I remember we had a conversation um, when he's referencing one of my paintings. And one, the first thing he brought up was like, I love that scuff mark on the suit. And I was like, who pays attention to the scuff mark on a suit? And he was like, just the details. and. Uh, it's interesting to hear that because I had no idea that was like one of the determining factors. Um, but portraiture, let me get back to that, just became like something that I was naturally drawn to. Um, and what are, you, what are you trying to convey, do you think, in a, portrait, in a portrait? Or what are you trying to, I guess, accomplish that makes you feel good about a portrait that you've prepared? Well, it's, it's, it's trying to get the viewer to also know and have a connection with um, basically a two-dimensional image and trying to draw from that an idea of what the person is actually like, just based on the way it's painted, the things that are included, um, nuances of the person. Um, for example, judge's hands in the painting. Yeah, I'm Fingers sad. are inter interlaced. I mean, yes. that means he's like comfortable. And if you try to interlace your fingers any other way, you'll feel uncomfortable. So it should be like, you just, just like little nuances in the way people, mannerisms. Yeah, and I think we'll get to some of the amazing details of the painting in a bit. But before we talk about that, I wanted to ask you, so obviously, Judge, you're known very much for uh, your work in the law, your, your decades of legal jurisprudence. But can you tell me a bit about what art and portraiture meant to you um, growing up and as an adult? Um, and uh, what it means to sort of see yourself represented now at the end at this point in your career. Well, actually, my answer to that would have two parts. Uh, uh, growing up, I wanted to be a painter myself. I, I started out uh, in high school and college painting, uh, mainly landscape painting. I found uh, painting people too challenging. Uh, it, it was an act that I knew that I did not have. But I was sensitive to painting, and I, and, I, and I knew that painting was a way of expressing things that you could not, that would not otherwise be seen. That's what the artist does. He, he, he or she draws attention to what is otherwise unseeable. And, um, and then I decided I wanted to be an architect because I love the beauty of, of uh, creating things, not, not paintings, but buildings, and uh, the gracefulness of a structure, uh, but, but all that from the perspective of, of an artist. And then that led to my strong interest in mathematics. You know, and I, when I went to college, I was going to be a math major. But I saw mathematics as an extension of art because it's pure, and it can be so graceful, and it can be so simple. and uh, you know, if you're looking at um, uh, uh, one of the buildings in Washington, D.C., the, uh, the African-American building, you have to capture the beauty and grace of the building itself. And, uh, and that's art, even though it's architecture. That, that's, that's art in a very pure sense, too. Um, or some of the old structures, you know, Greek temples, beautiful art. 
And so I just had this very strong interest in art. And, but then that waned when I realized that I unfortunately was not talented and I could not do that kind of work. Great ideas, but in practice I clearly lacked uh, the, what would I, the inspiration, but more importantly the, the ability and went into law instead and abandoned art. I, I tell people I was not willing to die for my art. I was not that dedicated to art that I was going to starve to death. So I knew that I had to find a profession that would at least put food on the table and went into um, uh, law. But, uh, uh, so w w when this project came forward, those sensibilities sort of came to the forefront. And when my clerks confronted me with the idea that I would have my portrait done, which is the second part of your question, uh, it, was, it was frightening. I, um, uh, you know, I think we all kind of wonder how people see us. Uh, I remember there's a, a great line from a, a play uh, that when you walk into a room of uh, people, you are the only person who can't see yourself. Uh, everyone around you can see you, but you can't see yourself. And so everyone around you actually has an impression of you as to what you look like, uh, what they think you might be like based on what you look like, but you don't know what you look like. And that is frightening because uh, uh, an obvious uh, clear example is, you know, you might have uh, a piece of food stuck on under your, uh, your eyes or something. But you don't know that because you can't see yourself. But that's, that's an obvious instance. But in a more bigger sense, our features are just not captured so that we can see them. Other than looking in a mirror, and I don't think a mirror always tells the truth. So you walk into this room, and also even when you look into a mirror, you don't see how you laugh. When you walk into a room, you laugh, but you don't see yourself laugh. Or you walk into a room and you might be sullen, but you don't see yourself sullen. But everyone around does. So in many ways, you are the only person in the room who doesn't know you and how you're coming across. And that's scary because what, you, what, what happened here is that uh, this artist was going to give his impression of me. And in many ways, I did not know what I, how I come across. And I, for him to then tell me how I come, uh, how I, I come across, at least to him, was frightening. Uh, I, 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 it, was, it was awesome. So a portrait, in some ways, is a journey into the self. It is a journey into the self, see. right. Yeah. And just sort of picking up on that sort of theme is, you know, obviously the the there is a recognition of the work that you've done in, in your career that exists and is embodied in the decisions that you've made, the, the, uh, the thousands of pages, pages of decisions that you've issued in your, um, in your public service as a judge. And there's something kind of abstract and kind of conceptual about law in that way. And what's unique about this is it's a transition to um, you're no longer the author, you're the subject. And... Uh, there is a physicality to, to recognizing your office and your work uh, in, um, in the form of the painting. And I, I want to ask you, like, what did it feel like to sit for that, to sit for the, 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 the portraiture? And it sounds like Wade is, is laughing, laughing about, about that. that. Well, that was his <laughs> challenge. Yeah. He had the challenge of bringing out the personal side of me. Um, I... I, I I don't know whether I would call it audacity or ego, to say, well, I want to sit in a way that represents my work as a judge. I don't think I'm the one who should do that. I think the history should do that. And also, I think that would be a pretty haughty uh, 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 reason for someone to sit. So, well, I want to be so, I want to, I want to show how important I am. And that was not my goal here. And in fact, I told Wade, now let him answer what I wanted. 
we, we went into the weeds, we went into the details. And he can tell that. Uh, Judge, this is a lot. Um, he wanted a lot, um, but he also didn't want it to come off as um, too much, if that makes sense. Um, he wanted subtle, but he also wanted it to be grand. It was, it was like a, a dichotomy between the two. Um, there are times when he was definitely tired of me being in the room and like having the judge, you need to sit this way, turn this way. And he's just like, that's true. All right. how, how, I, how, I definitely <laughs> got tired of him. No, no ifs, ands, or buts on that one. How much longer is this going to take? And was, you know, I'd rather be doing anything else than this. Um, which was part of the process for me because after spending so much time with him and him spending so much time with me, he becomes uh, more relaxed over time. So where he's not trying to pose for the portrait and he's just letting it happen. And I think that worked for, for a judge because once he was settled in, he was just like, and that, that was it. Like it wasn't, he wasn't trying to like sit up straight or like turn a certain way. He just like fell into it, um, which for me is ultimately my end goal in trying to capture someone because you don't get to know someone like the second you're sitting with them. It's the time that goes into it where they get to know you and you get to know their mannerisms. You get to know not but not to bother him. Like if, if he pulls his phone out and he's doing something, you're just like, I'll let Judge sit there and go through whatever he's reading because that allows him to, you know, go into himself and just fall back into his natural rhythm. And then I'll have to pull him out and like, Judge, I'm ready. And he's like, okay, do I need the robe now? It's like, we'll take a couple without the robe and then we can put the robe on. Um, so it's a lot of give and take on both ends. So I, and with that kind of um, relationship, over the couple of hours and uh, about a couple hundred shots, um, he eventually like settled in. Yeah, so you do need that time, it sounds like, to get to the person's authentic self, to get to a place where there's that level of comfort to capture that. Just to talk about the process, um, because I think that's of interest, how long, how, how long was the process of, of preparing this particular painting? Well, for me, it started before the actual painting began, because once I found out I was going to be painting judge, I did some research, got some images from the internet, and did some studies at home just to get an idea of like, how judge would look at a certain angle, and then for me to be comfortable with painting him. Um, so the process itself took probably more than a little, about a year, but leading up to it, as a, a couple weeks of just studying and drawing judge, and then discussing with him the things that he wanted and what he expected. And then there's, for me to be able to, I think, authentically capture someone, I feel like I need to speak with people who know them better than I do. Um, because I feel the more connected I am to them, the better the portrait comes out. So I met with his wife and his son. Um, we broke bread together and uh, went over to dinner with Judge and his wife and uh, just talked about like his ideas and um, things he did personally outside of, of, of being a judge mm -hmm. and how that would play into the portrait. Um, so for me, it was like taking all those things, it's like mixing up uh, a recipe um, for the painting and then having that turn into the portrait. Is there anything you learned about him from those discussions with, uh, with family and friends that surprised you? Judge has a very good sense of humor. <laughs> he's, he's actually very funny and like down to earth. Um, and uh, when you hear you're meeting a judge, you, you, all the preconceived notions of like, this guy is gonna be very serious, very stern. And, but he's just like a regular and down to earth, like genuinely funny person and charming. Um, which I didn't, I didn't know what to expect um, because there are not very many videos of him online. So you're just like, okay. I just have images to work with. I have no, nothing to base it off of. Um, so that for me was interesting. And the fact that he's just like, okay. But then there are definitely things that he's like, definitely like assertive about, like, no. It'll just come out and it's it, no. <laughs> so it's like, okay. All right, Judge, we'll, we'll do that. And um, he's, he's very knowledgeable about everything. Um, 
I remember one conversation we had, um, we were talking about art and the way artists see things and um, how every person can see the same thing, but they can, the painting will look completely different. And that comes down to how they see. So we're going through the history of paintings and he was like, maybe they painted this way because they had a, like a visual impairment or they just saw the colors differently. And so that, that's why their paintings look a certain way. Maybe they weren't really masters. They were just like, this is how I see. And because it's so not common, like it becomes known as this great painting. Like, uh, I think we were talking about Van Gogh. All right. I, well, we were talking about the uh, impressionist and post-impressionist artist. And I am terribly, terribly nearsighted. Uh, these are some nice glasses that are thinner, but I grew up with Coke bottle glasses. And when I take my glasses off, things come across to me as an impressionist painting. In other words, I see light. I, I don't see that white light there. What I'll see is white, black, white, black, and it'll all be sort of out of focus. So it's just like an impressionist painting. Instead of seeing a solid piece of red, my eyes will break it down into uh, yellow and even a touch of green, and, but it'll come across when it's together as red. So I often wondered whether the post-impressionists were all nearsighted. <laughs> and I, we had that discussion. And I said, I said you know, I, I, you know I, maybe if I painted myself and took off my glasses, I would be a great <laughs> post-impressionist <laughs> artist today since I see things in, with light broken down rather than just solid colors. And I said, yeah, you know, maybe I missed my career. <laughs> And whoever invented glasses for nearsighted people got rid of a whole generation <laughs> of really, really creative post-impressionists, myself included. Anyway, I think we had that discussion. I think we have a new school of art that we're <laughs> founding right as we sit here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's excellent. And one thing I, I wanted to ask, though, is that, so you've talked about kind of getting to know a person and understanding their authentic self, their natural self. That takes time. It takes a long time, in this case, a year of preparation and study and discussion, consultation, and physical time. But also a painting can, is, is going to capture one aspect of a person in some regards. This painting, in fact, I think captures one aspect of you in your formal position, in your robe, versus your many other roles. And I'm curious to know kind of what you, in some ways, wanted to convey yourself as the subject of this painting. There's not, no piece of art can convey every facet of you, but what did you want sort of future, future members of the public to know about you um, as, a, as, a, as a person, as a human in this piece of art? Well, the first thing is I didn't want it to be a picture, a photograph. And there, that photograph does not exist because there is no chair in front of the background with the stars and um, it just doesn't exist. And so it's not a photograph and I did not want a photograph. I can take a photograph, I get somebody to do it and pay him, you know, a few dollars or use an iPhone and just get it done for nothing. But, having said that, I wanted the, f the, f the uh, portrait to, to reflect more of a composition. So the robe really is the law, uh, the, what I uh, feel the heaviness of my, do my job. And he, he, gives my, he makes my robe heavy, because my job is heavy. And, uh, and then I wanted the robe to reflect things that are important to me in my life. And um, so we started with where would I be sitting? And we had a lot of discussion about that. And we looked at catalogs and we looked at chairs. And I had seen some catalogs where the judges were seated in rather um, simple but very uh, stately chairs. And then I saw some where the judges might be seated uh, in a more sort of a heavy chair rather than a simple chair. More of a judge chair, I guess, is what you might want to call The kind of chair, in fact, that I use when I sit on the bench. It reflects sort of the, uh, the majesty of the job itself. Um, 
And we went through that and I just couldn't come across the chair that I wanted. And finally I said, you know, why don't we do the chair that I sit in every day at home? And that's the chair he painted. And that chair was given to me by my grandfather. And, uh, and I relish that chair, even though it is definitely not comfortable. Uh, probably has given me a few back aches because of the way it's designed. But it means a lot to me to sit in that chair because it was my grandfather's chair. So the chair in some ways is nothing but an extension of me. And the chair is an extension of my family and my family's history. And while you might not gather that from the painting itself, you might wonder why in, in 2022 I would be sitting in a chair that was probably put together uh, you know, back in the early part of the last century. Secondly, you might wonder why, considering the majesty that this portrait is supposed to convey, I would choose a chair that clearly, you know, did not cost a fortune. I mean, it's, it's not a chair you would find at a table at, uh, 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 you know, at some member of the Fortune 500. I mean, this is not that type of chair. This is a chair you would find of someone who is much more earthy, who probably uh, is a, perhaps a business person but nonetheless, not a super rich business person. So I wanted my chair to be more just a common chair. Uh, it's a swivel chair, but still in a business chair, but still a chair I think that people who, who are from that period would recognize as something they may have owned. Uh, and I, we discussed that, and I said, yeah, that's the chair. Let's not discuss this anymore about choosing all these chairs. I want a chair that just reflects my own history and a chair I use. So the chair I'm sitting in is a chair I use. It's not an artificial chair that was brought in so that I could do a portrait. It is the chair. And at the same time, it's not a picture of me in the chair because I don't sit I don't have a robe when I sit in that chair. You know, when I'm sitting in that chair, it's Saturday morning, and uh, you know, I barely have anything on, let alone a robe on, <laughs> and uh, and that's the chair I sit in. So uh, and that's when I was getting to the point that it's not a picture; it's it's a composite. And uh, so the chair is, is was really super important to me, and we talked about it, and I told him about my grandfather, and I told him how important it was to me. Yeah, that, that definitely, I think, comes across uh, the, these elements of the composition. One question about, that comes up about this chair, sort of uh, in line with what you're saying, is this really interesting uh, cushion. On the very edge of it, if you can see, it's a detail. There's, it's frayed at the very kind of bottom right. Um, and I just think that that's a lovely little, very homey detail. And I, can you... can either or both of you tell me a bit about this cushion? Yes, that cushion has meaning. Uh, that cushion was sewn by a woman who will be present at my uh, uh, celebration later today. She's now in her 90s. Uh, she was one of my first client, if not my first client. And the way she paid me was she felt sorry that I had to sit on that hard chair so she paid me by sewing me a cushion. And I have used that cushion f ever since, from 1974, when she gave me that cushion as my first uh, client, paying client. I, 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 I'm confused. I don't know whether she would be considered a paying client, since she gave me <laughs> a gift a and, not, and not a green dollar, and that's not question. so green. I mean, but anyway, she, that, that cushion, and I've been using it ever since. You know, it's almost 50 years. And, um, and it's frayed because it is old. And it's, again, not something that I put into the picture to, uh, to make me look, uh, you know, regal and stuff. But it reflects who I was and it reflects how important the cushion is to me. So uh, uh, that she gave me that cushion, that was uh, a symbol of who I am. And, I, you know, actually I'm thinking out loud now, I think the cushion also represents the fact that she could not pay me. So this is a picture that has a cushion paid by someone who in many ways reflects my history on the bench, 
which has been to reach out to people who can't afford to pay you, but pay only with cushions. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to talk a bit more now about some of the details of the painting. But before we do that, I, I wanted to ask you, Wade, because some of your prior work um, um, in portraiture has really focused on details. And that is a really powerful part of your portraiture. And I'm, cu I, I'm curious to know how you come to that as a, as a mode of expression and what those details mean to you um, when you're putting a painting together. So details for me are like a way to get viewers involved. Um, because in order for details to be details is that they have to draw you in. You have to become interested in it because it's 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 something that catches your eye, um, and they're like for, for example, you point out that out. So, I, did, I didn't notice that it was frayed, but in fact it is frayed. Mm -hmm. he but so he he uh, he did not try to make it the cushion into something it was not. <laughs> I mean, the, the cushion itself isn't much of a cushion anymore. <laughs> <laughs> After 50 years, After 50 years. Well, but, that's probably a good, <laughs> it's, it's probably true. It's yeah, I, in many ways, I'm now sitting on the bottom of the chair. <laughs> but it's a for me, that, that cushion is more valuable than any payment she could have given you. That's because true. You would have spent whatever she, kind of uh, yeah. funds she would give you by now, but it's still around to this day, um, literally supporting you. Um, but those details, like, or what bring people in, and it's what tells more about the story. Um, like, I remember one of our conversations we were discussing uh, if you wanted a flag or not. Right. Right? And uh, we eventually settled on no flag. Um, but for me, I found different ways to kind of reference the flag. Um, you've got, like, your, star, your striped tie, right? right? It's uh, red, white, and blue. And then you've got the stars in the background. Right, and there's those stars, there's 13 of them, right? And I incorporated your daughter's quilt into those stars. And for me, those stars, those 13 stars are like the 13 founding colonies, right? So in a, in a way, it's an homage to like the history um, and kind of like the quilt that, that was the original flag was like a quilt. And then you bringing your daughter into it and referencing the quilt um, kind of like for me tied the whole thing together in kind of like your history and the history uh, of the United States and you being a federal official like that's a lot of weight yeah. and try to get that into a painting um, I'll say for me as, a, as an observer that one of the most striking things about the painting is the background in contrast with the with the figure the the images of the stars um, in, in sort of contrast with the, the, sh the sharp and focus um, uh, depiction of the individual that's being represented. And I think there's something really beautiful in the color palette and the abstraction versus the real kind of humanity that comes out from the painting itself. And that is one of the things I think is really powerful about that painting is that juxtaposition. But just to dig in, because I think there's a lot that you said there, the the stars that are um, in this painting, in one respect, are a <laughs> representation in part of this courtroom. Uh, there is. You mean the yes? The behind the bench, there are stars just like that. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. But the stars in this painting are different in some respects in detail than the exact stars that are in the famous courtroom that we're seated in today. And if you look closer into the details, there's texture within each of the components of the stars. And I wanted to just ask you how you, how you created that texture, where it came from, just to understand a little bit more of the story of where that came from. Well, the, te the texture, um, because I didn't want to veer too far from the original reference, um, was because Judge had asked that I somehow incorporate a quilt that his daughter was working on into the painting. I and I tried to make it as subtle as possible because I didn't want uh, the quilt to take away from, from the subject. So my way of doing that was finding a section of the quilt that closely resembled in terms of color the original reference and then try to embed that and hide that within the background. And what did that... What did the stars mean to you? Why did you ask for that component to be included in this part of the painting? 
I wanted it in the painting because, to me, more importantly than the uh, the flag, which is typically in a lot of portraits of judges, and I, I, I love the flag. It was not a conscious effort to, to, uh, to keep the flag out. It was more an effort to find out how could I achieve the same end, uh, but in a way that I felt it should come across in the picture. And those stars are on our flag. And, uh, uh, and I wanted the focus to be more on the stars than some huge red, uh, white, and blue flag, which would have dominated a, a part of the picture. This way, the flag is there through the stars, but it's something where you're drawn more to the aspect of the flag, which is the stars. And, uh, and of course, it was, it's Wade's idea as to how to compose the stars. And I did say that I wanted the stars, as far as color and shape and maybe design, to reflect to my daughter's quilt. And can you tell us about that quilt? Um, yeah, it was a quilt she was making uh, before she died. And uh, I thought that, uh, uh, that if the picture was going to have meaning to me, even though I know that the picture should have meaning to everyone. But I think that looking back at portraiture over history, uh, when people dig beneath the initial person who's portrayed, they find that those pictures uh, convey things of the times that were personal to the person who's in the picture. And I think a lot of portraiture today has forsaken, forgotten that. And so anyone who was looking at this, you know, as they get to a deeper level, say, well, why are those stars shaped so oddly? Or why are they slightly, you know, have blue and a little other colors in them rather than the pure, pure gold that the original was? Which is going to open the question of researching, why did I do that? And that's going to open up a research as to who I was and who uh, back then. And I think the picture begs from, uh, uh, the picture in itself asks questions. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and that I think is one of w how the stories are embedded in the image is part of what makes it powerful is even if you don't know all of the details behind that, you know there is a story underneath mm -hmm. it. it yeah, why, why would a judge want to sit on a picture? I mean, why would a judge want to sit on a pillow that's frayed? <laughs> that's a question. Yeah. And, I, and as I looked at old pictures, I found out, you know, those pictures ask questions. And typically, some of the pictures I had seen of other judges tended to be more photographs mm. than pictures. In other words, you could almost take a photograph of the judge in that posture. This photograph does not exist. It is a composition out of Wade's mind. Yeah, and I think one of the effects of the stars is to place the figure in it, you, in this constellation as a, in a sort of blue sort of pool of night and sky that is, I think, powerful. And recomposing the, the, the flag in that, uh, in, that, in, the, in that portrait is, I think, a, a powerful way of conveying you know, patriotism and the office in this particular way. Um, I think it's lovely. So I, I wanted to ask a little bit now about the, um, the expression, <laughs> the, the, the Mona Lisa at the center of the, the, the Mona Lisa. Uh, so how did you come to, it, 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 well, let me back up for a second. It, it's, it sounds like you sat for a long time um, to, to get different views and different sort of, um, different sort of senses of your image, sort of taken from Wade as the artist spending a lot of time with you. And within that process, you're going to have a lot of different kind of expressions, a different modes, different levels of comfort and relaxation. And how did you kind of settle on this one as the, as the end result for? That part of the process 
was 100% one of trust. Uh, going back to what I said about walking into the room, I am the only person who doesn't know what I look like when I'm sitting down and I'm relaxed. I have to trust the artist. So I can't answer that question. You have to ask Wade. Was it scary for you? Can I ask Yes, you? because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as you sort of see yourself, my God, do I look like that? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but anyway, that's the way he saw me, and uh, that was trust. I, I don't personally, other than looking in the mirror briefly, uh, uh, on, you know, for a split second, know what I look like over a period of time. And so he just has to capture it as best he can, and I trust that he has done that. May not like it. But, you know, we all want to look like movie stars, <laughs> but uh, we all can't look like movie stars. We have to be who we are, and I left it up to wait to convey that. So I can't, other than that, you've got to ask him how he came up with my expression. Well, um, I sent Judge two different images um, for him to review. Um, he liked different aspects of, of uh, both, both the, the initial images that I sent him. One he felt was too stern, and the other he felt was too uh, jovial, because he was smiling a lot in, the, in one of the images I sent him. So I had to come up with a third uh, kind of version that was kind of in between the two, because he didn't want to be seen as like the smiling judge. Um, so. He wanted to be more stern and more serious because of the weight of, of his position. Um, so he initially signed off on the, the third kind of composite. Um, he says that, you, you know, as he said, you walk into a room, you can't see yourself, but you also know how you don't want to be seen, <laughs> right? So um, it was kind of a, a play going back and forth. And even in the later stages when he came to the studio, he was like, hmm. <laughs> Could you change a little bit of this and a little bit of that? And I was like, okay, I'll I'll try, but I can't deviate too much. Um, you still have to be you. Um, but I think the biggest thing is like, I should have done this twenty years earlier. I said that <laughs> yes. you, you wanted to do it. Yeah, so I said I should have done this twenty years earlier. <laughs> well, but that's life. I've I've gotten over that. <laughs> well, one of the things that I think is on that subject that's sort of powerful about the painting is is the hands, partly because so much of the body is covered by this robe, this symbol of office, that you just have these peaks into the human underneath it. And I think the hands are quite sort of stunning and striking. And I wanted to ask Wade what you wanted, to, what, what you hope to convey with something kind of so human and so instrumental um, as a person's hands, as the judge's hands here. Well, hands, I mean, they convey a lot. They can uh, give you a glimpse into, like, what a person does for a living, how they treat themselves, um, uh, their mannerisms, like if they move their hands while they talk, um, if they're comfortable in their position. Like, as I was saying earlier, whenever you interlace your fingers, you always interlace them the same way because if you interlace them any other way, you feel uncomfortable. So for me, it was important to try and capture that moment in the hands because it was one of the few parts of Judge that's actually not covered. And so it becomes a focal point. So I had to make sure those things were painted uh, to the best of my ability just to capture, you know, his mannerisms and um, kind of like give you an idea of what he's like just based on like the way he poses his hands. Um, if he were a construction worker, those hands would look different. They might not be interlaced. They might be like balled up. Um, so it gives you an idea of what the person's like and what their profession is just based on how they like uh, display their hands or how they... Yeah, for, for me, I think it makes me think of, you know, the, 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 the texture, the color, the, the, um, and the, the instrumentality of the hand that, you know, <laughs> as the writer, as the painter, the, the, its role in doing the things that you have done. And and the age, the age and experience and time that has come with your, your work and your life. And that, I think, is a powerful part. Right. Mm -hmm. You can always, you know, put makeup on your face 
very little you can do to hide the age in your hands. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, just to, to ask about the expression again, the reason why I raised it is that, to me, <laughs> you're right, that there, you never know exactly how you'll be seen, and there is no one way of being seen. There's always the viewer and the, the viewed. But what I think can be said about this is there's a depth in the expression. There's, a de there's paintings where, as you said, it's a flatness, there's a, there's a, a picture, a photograph-like uh, element to it. But what's powerful about portraits, good portraits, is that you can see sort of into the, it stops being a two-dimensional image and you can start to see into the person's eyes. And I thought that that is, in this composite that you, you prepared, something powerful about the expression that you, you ultimately <laughs> kind of resolved on together. And I'm curious to know what you felt about seeing your own expression in this way, seeing it and perceiving it, and whether you, and on your part, whether you captured the, the, the fundamental expression of the person. Um, uh, you know, that, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I'm told I smile a lot. Um, but at the same time, my job is pretty weighty. And um, as Wade said, there was one where I was smiling a, a, a lot, and one where I was a lot more austere. Uh, than, than this one. I think I wanted to convey, because this was a portrait that would be in the courthouse, one that perhaps reflected more how I came across in court than how I came across in sort of my daily interactions with people and in a more informal setting. And while I was willing to include all of these things that arguably were unconnected, with me in court, I thought that my face should perhaps convey what people see when they walk in and see me in court. And what that means is... But the then gravity. again, I'm not that austere, period, anyway. So. <laughs> I don't know that I think it's that austere. This might be your impression of it, looking at the mirror suddenly, but perhaps one way to say it is the, the gravity of the, 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 the end, I think, the seriousness with which we're taking the work that we're involved in in this courtroom and that is respect for the parties that's dignity for the people who appear before the court is to convey that as a fundamental component of the position and the person who's involved in it um any thoughts from you on what you want and i know you were sort of it's a composition of different expressions different moments but I think it's central, so just was wanted to ask you what you felt about that. Well, for me, I just wanted to do judge justice um, because it's a lot of weight to to take on the responsibility to, to paint someone because this this isn't something that's like temporary. It's going to be a part of of history, and you're going to you're responsible for capturing that moment in time, and. When people look back, what are they going to think about Judge? Like, are they going to reference this painting as a moment in time for for um, what what was his his personality like just based on on like this one image that was painted of him? It's like when we look back at at paintings of former presidents that we've never uh, met. We have no recordings of, but. There's just one image that uh, they're known for, for all of time, because it's the one painting that was done of them that is like official. So it's a, a lot of weight on my end for me to kind of like, kind of have that kind of responsibility as an artist and hopefully um, it holds up over time. So I guess I want to return to uh, where we started maybe at the very beginning to see, ask you, Judge, what it means to you to see yourself uh, at this moment, at this point in your career, it's continuing, but to see yourself in this, what, what does it make you feel? What does it make me feel? Um, first of all, I, I, I did not like the idea of having it done, and I resisted until, 
And yet I never saw this job as being about me. This job has been about other people. I, I see myself as someone who just serves. And uh, I thought that uh, having a picture done did, did, did detracted from my role, which is to serve other people. I, you know, I'm not interested in all the trappings of, 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 of judging if you don't serve, you don't do what I consider the right thing at the right time. So that the portrait sort of was in tension with that. And yet I also realized that the court wanted it and they had the pictures of the other judges and I didn't want to seem out of sync. So it, in many ways the portrait was a compromise in the sense that I finally relented and said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, now that it's been done, I like it. I think it's, it's incredible. I think Wade has done just a, a majestic job. Um, um, I'm still humbled by the fact that they want to hang it. Uh, I, I still see myself as a, you know, the five-year-old kid from Tuskegee who, who liked reading books that nobody else was particularly interested in. Uh, uh, just because they were just not, you know, I, I was just an odd kid, and that's, I, I can't, I was a nerd. And I still see myself that way, so to have a portraiture done is, is a bit daunting. And if you had asked me whether this would have been done when I was 10, I would have said ridiculous. If you'd asked me whether it would have been at 20, I would have said ridiculous. Uh, 30, I would have said, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, jokingly said, okay, you know, and, and am I going to be in purple? <laughs> uh, but still essentially saying it's ridiculous. Um, I remember someone once said, you have to be gracious in accepting things that you might not want. When, uh, when people want to do something for you, and you may not necessarily want to do it, there comes a responsibility of grace and you have to be gracious. And I see this as my court wanting to do this, my law clerks wanting to do this, my friends wanting to do this. And so the end is not whether I particularly feel comfortable, but um, that, my, that others like it and I'm comfortable with it because of that. Good. And, well, you mentioned that a central part of this, is, of this work is, is public service, decades of public service at this point. But in some sense, it's important for the public to know that the people aren't abstract decisions. They're humans with pasts and stories behind them. And in some ways, a portrait, I think, can reemphasize that fact, that reemphasize the, the human being, the five-year-old uh, uh, lover of books at the heart of this work, and that that is something powerful to convey. There's a value to that for the public as well. I fully agree with that. And perhaps of all the reasons I've given, you probably articulated the best one. <laughs> so, you know, we're sitting here in the courtroom, in the Frank Johnson courtroom in 2022. Um, I'm curious to know what both of you think this, this portrait will mean, say, 42 more years from now. Um, how will future generations kind of look back at you, your work, and this painting? Um, that sort of follows up, I think, what you were just saying a moment ago. Um, 40 years from now, little kids should be able to see this painting and realize that they uh, albeit five and ten or twelve years old, can achieve uh, w whatever one might say I've achieved. And that's, that's really important. That's incredibly important. And that his, being a part of history is something that it's not for ourselves, it's for others. And um, uh, I hope that people who look at it in the future will ask the questions about, you know, what do the parts of the painting mean? Uh, when they look at it in the future, they may ask, well, why, is he, why doesn't he have a flag in the picture? Or if they look at it in the future, 
They may ask, uh, you know, why is he seated that way in contrast to the way I've seen all the other judges seated? Um, and when they get answers to those questions, I hope they'll think more favorably towards me. And for you, Wade, um, as an artist, how do you want your work to be seen in the future? How do you hope it will be seen, I suppose? Wow, that's a very tough question to answer as an artist because as an artist, at least now, um, the way work is perceived now in the art world, it's very like instant. Mm -hmm. Like everything that's seen now is on Instagram, it's on a video. Um, and for the, as long as I've been studying painting, painting has been dead. So it just keeps dying. So I, I hope it continues to live um, in the realm that it's living in now and still be relevant in the future. And I hope that more people will have their portraits done and they'll look to this and compare it to previous portraits and ask why is this one so different. Um, and I think the fact that it's different makes it significant. Um, so that's uh, all Definitely. I can hope for. I think there's no question it's a part of history and that is uh, a real accomplishment. And with that, I'm really delighted to talk to both of you about this um, and thank you.